we begin with prayer. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great privilege of coming here to worship you in spirit and in truth. Direct our hearts and our minds so that we may worship truly from our hearts and give praise to your holy name. May our worship be pleasing to you through Jesus Christ, who has cleansed us from all our sin. Fill us with the only true wisdom, the wisdom of your salvation, Christ crucified for us. We ask this in his name. Amen. Following the order of service this morning on the colored insert in your bulletin, we begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O 
Lord open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, it is faithful and just to forgive us our sins us from all unrighteousness. Let's join and pray together. Almighty God, merciful Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. But I am sorry for my transgressions, and I pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto me. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Renew me by your spirit, and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord who has begun this good work in you bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. study of the Lord's Prayer as we take up a view of the doxology or those concluding verses where Jesus speaks about the kingdom, the power, and the glory being God's. Our Old Testament reading emphasizes these three aspects of God's power, kingdom, and glory. We're reading from Psalm 145, verses 10 through 21. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. 
He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Here ends our Old Testament reading. Alleluia, alleluia. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Alleluia. Please rise. Gospel reading is found recorded in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. In these verses from the Gospel of Mark, we take up a look at the end of Jesus' ministry as he tells his disciples about the day in which he would come again. And again, those those key words of kingdom, glory, and power will all be emphasized as it refers to Jesus' kingdom on the last day. We're reading in verse 24 of Mark chapter 13. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now learn the, this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also when you see these things happening, know that it is near, at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray. For you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Here ends our gospel reading. We join to make confession of our faith in that Savior who has promised to return again with kingdom, power, and glory to rule forever and ever. We join to make confession of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
these rides. Grace, mercy, and peace be to each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Word of God, which we're considering this morning, is found recorded in Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. John writes, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. This is the word of our God. Please be seated. In the name of our Savior Jesus, who encourages us, who directs us, ask and it shall be given you, your fellow redeemed. The book of Revelation is one of those books in conservative Lutheran circles that is often not dealt with. Many times I've found as a pastor that people are afraid to read through the book of Revelation. And there's certainly a lot of false teachings that have been promoted as a result of a misunderstanding or misreading of the book of Revelation. But if you were to take the book of Revelation and boil it down, it really has a simple purpose and message. The last book of the Bible was intended by God, the Holy Spirit, in order to comfort New Testament believers and the rest of New Testament believers until Jesus returns again, who faced persecution for their faith with the confidence that in the end God's kingdom would come to them. It would be revealed. It would be fulfilled. There's a lot of picture language in the book of Revelation. Chapter 12 is one of those chapters that gives us some of this picture language. The opening verses of chapter 12 describes a woman who's about to give birth, a great red dragon who's trying to kill the woman and to prevent her from giving birth. And when he is not able to prevent the woman from giving birth, he then seeks out her descendants in order to destroy them. Well, consider the last 6,000 years of history. In particular, these verses are emphasizing the last 2,000 years of church history and how the devil, who was defeated by Christ's death on the cross, has been striving simply to destroy Christ's church on earth by his wiles and devastation through false teaching in order to lead people away from God and away from his kingdom, his power, and his glory. After John sees this picture of the great red dragon and the woman, he gives us the verses of our text. Once the devil was defeated and cast down, we're told that John heard a voice in heaven saying, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. You might notice that the word prayer or pray is not found in the verses of our text. And yet it is this truth recorded in Revelation chapter 12 that gives us the basis for why 
we pray. As New Testament believers, we are engaged in a battle against the devil. John tells us that he has great wrath, and he knows that he has a little time. Salvation has been completed. The devil doesn't know how much time he has before that ultimate judgment and destruction which was prophesied against him is finally carried out. And so while he has the time, he continues to engage the child of the woman, the church, striving to destroy them through his power. As Christians, we need to understand that the dangers that surround us as Christians and as a church, and I don't mean Grace Lutheran Church, but the Holy Christian Church, that those dangers are very real for us still today. The Apostle Peter made it very clear when he said that the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But stand against him steadfast in the faith, Peter said. The devil has been defeated. But imagine a lion in a cage that's been prodded. He becomes more and more angry, doesn't he? And that's the way the devil is. He knows that he's been defeated. And as a result of that knowledge, he's more aggressive than ever against God's church. In the ministry of Jesus, we see the devil and his angels at work in many ways through false teaching, yes, but also through the possessions that were demonstrated during the ministry of Jesus, that both Jesus and his apostles cast out. Those evil spirits were active in leading people away from Christ, destroying who they were. Those dangers are just as real for us today. John says, the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Throughout our study of the Lord's Prayer, we've reviewed again the major enemies that we face as Christians. Luther summarized them in three, the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. I like to ask my confirmation students when we discuss those three groups, which one they think is the worst of our enemies. And inevitably, they'll say, it's the devil. He's powerful, he's great, he's strong, he's the great red dragon. And yet, probably the greatest enemy that we face as Christians is not the enemy on the outside, the devil or the world, but the one on the inside, our own sinful flesh. John emphasizes this in our text when he says, the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. One of the, reas the reasons that we see that this danger is so real is because the danger is within us. We have that sinful flesh which is constantly going against God's will and His way for us. Our nature wants to rebel against God, to reject God, to do it my way, at my time. The problem that we have is that our sins, the sins that we have committed in thought, in word, and in deed, are worthy to be accused. The devil has all the ammunition that he needs to bring before God to point at each one of us and say, look at the sins that this person has committed. We've given him all the ammunition that he needs in order to destroy us. We've received and should receive that just judgment against our sins because of our sinful flesh. We confess that we were born in sin, conceived in sin, that we've added to that inherited sin by our actual sins throughout our lives. The devil comes and he accuses us. He's known as Satan, the accuser. He has all that he needs in order to judge us before God. Day and night he brings our sins, which we have committed, before God and says, look, look at what these people have done, these people that you love. 
the devil is the accuser. Our own sin condemns us. The Lord's Prayer, we have considered one of those petitions which recognizes our own sin and failing when we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As Christians, we don't, we don't hide our sin. We shouldn't hide our sin. We should admit our sin, confess our sin before God, knowing that He is gracious to forgive those sins in Christ. John goes on in the final verse of our text when he speaks again about the devil. The devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Yes, we rebel against our own sinful flesh, that old Adam within each one of us. We struggle against the sins, the temptations, the desires that the flesh has within it. The Apostle Paul looked at himself and he says that, I know that that which is in me, there's nothing good at all. The things that I want to do by the new man, those things I don't do. And the things that I know that I shouldn't do, those are the things that I find myself doing. We all struggle with that old Adam within us. But the devil also is our enemy. He t continues to sow the seeds of false teaching. Even in the visible church here on earth, in order to lead people away from the truth, he uses the world around us in order to tempt us to stray away from the truth of God's Word or to not listen to what He reveals to us. The devil has been cast down. And he's all the more eager and vigilant because he knows his time is short. That might seem like a scary truth. The book of Revelation in many places does seem very scary. The reality of sin, its ugliness, the devastation and the power of the devil are very real. And yet as we consider those verses of John, we should take comfort in the fact that the devil's time is short. Yes, he may be all the more eager to devour us as Christians. And he's not concerned about the world, but he's concerned about us, those who hold to, adhere to God's truth. But his time is short. The book of Revelation describes not only the ugliness of the problem, and how harsh it is for us as Christians, but it also gives us comfort. John tells us in verse 12, Therefore, Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. After describing the great red dragon of Revelation, you might say, well, what do we have to rejoice about? What is there to be sure about, to be confident about? John says, rejoice, O heavens. Rejoice that the devil's time is short. Rejoice that he has been defeated once and for all. In the opening verse of our text, John says he hears this voice saying what? Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. The devil is powerful. We want to give the devil his due. We want to recognize that he is destructive, dangerous, full of lies. And yet the devil's power, as great as it is, is nothing compared to the power, the strength, and the kingdom of our God. It pales in comparison to the one who has defeated him. John in verse 11 says that as Christians, the church has overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. See, the victory is ours. John says, Jesus has defeated the devil. The church has overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb. That event on Calvary, on Good Friday, was the fulfillment of what God had prophesied 4,000 years earlier when he told Satan, 
that he would send a deliverer who would crush the head of the serpent. When Jesus died on the cross, the devil was defeated. His head was crushed. His power was taken away. The war was over. But John tells us that not only was the devil overcome by the church through the blood of the Lamb, but also by the word of their testimony. If we had not been taught the truth of God's word, if we had not been instructed in what Jesus had done for us when we were little children in Sunday school, if we had not continued to grow in our knowledge of what God had done for us, then the salvation that Christ won for you and for me on the cross would mean nothing. That salvation has been brought to us because we have heard the word of the testimony about the Lamb who gave His blood for us. And the same thing is true for us. Just as we have been instructed in that truth by those when we were young, so also we have the opportunity to proclaim that word of the testimony to the next generation and the next generation that they too might know that the victory has been won. That the devil has been defeated. No matter how powerful he may seem, the war is over. Christ has won the victory. Our salvation is sure. John in his following verses there emphasizes the power and the confidence that this message gave to the early church. As New Testament believers in the 21st century, we may not be able to relate to this as the early church did. John says, they, the church, overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Eleven of the twelve apostles of Jesus gave their life for the testimony of the word. Throughout the centuries that followed under Roman persecution, Christian after Christian were martyred and put to death. Church history tells us of one old man, a man by the name of Polycarp, who sat at the feet of John the Apostle. When he was over 70 years of age, he was brought before the king and asked to recant his Christian faith, to give his credence, his declaration of faith to the Roman gods. He refused. They, tied, they were going to tie him to a stake and burn him alive. He said, you don't need to tie me. He said, I'm not going to run. I know who my Savior is. Polycarp gave his life. He did not love his life more than the testimony of the word that he had come to know and appreciate. That declaration of the Lamb who gave his blood for him was the most important thing of all. It was what gave him confidence even to look death in the face and to say, I know that my Redeemer lives. We have not faced such persecution in our lives. And yet the devil's attacks, because his time is short, continue against the church. Polycarp understood that the kingdom, the power, and the glory were the Lord's. We turn to the Lord in prayer in those times of difficulties throughout our lives, knowing that what he has promised, he will fulfill and has fulfilled in Christ. As believers, we have reason to rejoice. We have reason to pray before our God as we face our own sinful flesh and the attacks of the devil, knowing that God will hear and that he will answer. And being confident that the victory has already been won. Jesus has defeated sin, our sin. He has destroyed the power of the devil. He has opened up for us the door to eternal life. It's for that reason that we as Christians continue to pray that prayer which he has taught us. That his name would be hallowed. That his kingdom would come. That his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
We pray for the forgiveness of our sins and the ability and the strength to forgive those who sin against us. We pray that the Lord would give us our daily bread, even though we don't deserve it. That he would lead us out of temptation and deliver us from evil. We have the confidence to pray all of those things, knowing that his is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Jesus Christ, our Redeemer from sin. We thank you that we who labor under a heavy burden of sin and troubles are able to come to you by your gracious invitation and find rest for our souls. Through the love which you have shown to us by suffering and dying for our sins, give us boldness to call upon your name for all of our needs. Give us courage to ask for your forgiveness when we sin, to seek your comfort and assurance in all our troubles. Whenever we need a greater measure of strength to carry out our daily tasks and our Christian duties or guidance to conduct our everyday work, teach us to ask these things of you. Remind us to pray for those spiritual blessings of courage and help to overcome evil, for zeal to live godly lives. Let us never hesitate to approach your throne of grace for healing from sickness, help from trouble, solutions to the problems that we face, and rescue from danger. Let us not fail to pray for your promised gift of the Holy Spirit, for we need him daily to open the scriptures to our understanding and to nourish and preserve us in our faith. Blessed Jesus, ever give us faith to trust that you are our Savior from sin and our Lord who has all power in heaven and on earth. We believe in you, but help us also in our moments of unbelief. Enable us to pray in faith, in no way doubting that you will hear or answer us. Through your Spirit, teach us always what things to pray for, so that our requests agree with your good and gracious will. Teach us also to include the needs of others in our prayers, lest we think only of ourselves. Dear Savior, we confess that we often neglect to commit our needs to you in prayer, as well as the many things that trouble us and burden our souls. We confess we often make errors of judgment simply because we fail to seek your good counsel. How often we neglect to express our thanks and our praise for all that you have done for us. And because of our thoughtlessness, we often ask you for foolish and hurtful things. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would forgive these and all of our sins and teach us always how to pray, trusting that yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. We ask all of this in the name of our Savior, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.